function of the inner ear. Now, when we um, speak about how to improve um, the function of the uh, sensory system, uh, we actually can do it in different ways. Um, one you saw this morning with the demonstration of the surgeries. The other is we can use um, some medication for uh, some conditions. Uh, but often we are desperate not being able to improve function and therefore uh, we use uh, kind of auditory implants. Now the passive implants, the reconstruction of the circular chain, we also have seen this morning. I want to focus on active middle ear implants and cochlear implants. Now when we look on the mode of stimulation, what is the difference? Uh, acoustic hearing aid is just uh, an amplifier that makes the sound louder. The sound has to be transmitted through the eardrum, the middle ear, into the inner ear. The cochlear implant um, is basically a substitute of the inner hair cells, uh, which act like a microphone. So the, sh the sound is taken and converted into electrical pulses uh, given on the nerve, and the nerve as a cable gives it to our central computer. And then we have in between um, the mechanical stimulation of the um, middle and inner ear, um, where you uh, still need a certain amount of um, sensory cells um, for the patient to hear. Now these implantable hearing aids or acoustic implants is all the same. They stimulate mechanically on any of the coupling sites from the eardrum to the inner ear. Um, what are indications for these acoustic implants? Well, severe to profound mixed hearing loss. For instance, those where you have uh, tried to improve the conductive component is not possible, and the patient has, in addition, um, also some inner ear hearing loss. So these patients normally don't benefit from a hearing aid. Um, then we have moderate to severe sensory neural hearing loss, those who basically have a problem with the outer ear canal. Uh, and where acoustic amplification does not give um, satisfying functional results. In the future, we have some uh, things we can do as a combination of perhaps such a system with a cochlear implant in cases where we have progressive hearing loss and so on. So the, the working horse for these acoustic implants is the, the Weinbrunn Sound Bridge, um, which uh, was introduced into the market in 1996, with the first surgery being done by Ugo Fisch. We then started in 97 Hanover, and the principle is that you have an actuator um, which is coupled with one point uh, at the auricular chain or the inner ear. It's floating mass transducer, you see the action. It's basically a permanent magnet which is moved forth and back by um, um, an AC which is applied through a coil. The coil goes here uh, around the, 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 the permanent magnet, and then it moves forth and back as you can see down here. Now this has been used uh, initially for sensory and neural hearing loss. You see it coupled to the incus. That was the original way to do it. Now, in the meantime, um, some uh, surgeons said, well, we also can use it in other coupling ways, vibrant sound bridge on the round window, and the uh, copy, um, um, combine it with piston, pop, chop, um, and um, we also can, of course, um, do it in different ways how to couple. Robert Milinski is uh, here, and he will show you what you can do with more advanced coupling um, modes for this kind of an universal uh, driver, uh, mechanical driver um, of the middle and inner ear. So um, patients normally you can surf, uh, the audiogram is shown here, that's around the maximum or let's say the more or less the maximum of inner ear hing loss you can surf. You get then a certain gain which is uh, you see shown here. It's centered around uh, this frequency range to 1000 to uh, let's say 4,000 hertz, and patients normally get a huge improvement in the speech recognition or the speech discrimination as been shown here to the unaided situation. So that's what you normally have is incos coupling, but you also would get the same with any other coupling site. Interesting and important is that these results are stable. So as long as the inner ear function um, does not become poorer and poorer, which of course occurs by aging, but still, if that's the case, you see there's very good function over time. You see here from a study we made on those patients following them more than eight years, uh, they still benefit even after 10, 12, 15 years, as long as the inner ear still is in this indication range. If you need more power, then you have to go for a two-point coupling uh, device. You see here. 
the indication range for the so-called autologics, now cochlear, middle ear transducer, and it's a fully implantable version, the called Carina. Um, so the principle is also an actuator, uh, which is coupling to the auricular chain here, given on the incus, but you also could do it anywhere, uh, uh, on the middle ear or also on the round window. And this actuator is fixed to the rim of the mastoid. So you have a two-point fixation system. One is here at the, uh, at the mastoid, so the whole skull, so to say, is an anchor point. And then you have here this tiny tip, which goes in uh, onto the ossicle, um, ossicular chain. And it's driving the, uh, the ossicular chain. So that's the, the, the MAT transducer. Now you see here the gain. It's across frequencies. You see more flat. Also the low and high frequencies, you get more gain than with the um, vibrant uh, sound bridge, the FMT. And that means that you can serve also patients who have more pronounced in the ear hearing loss. And um, now, the point is then when we look on the results, you see here pre-op uh, bone conduction uh, on, the, uh, on the horizontal and the aided work recognition score on the um, vertical axis, you see that we have quite a, a range of results, which means that probably the coupling might be an issue, um, but also that the cochlear reserve of these patients uh, might be very different. And that's one of the critical points uh, for these devices how to um, evaluate the, uh, the cochlear reserve. So how much can the ear still do um, before you implant? Uh, something which is not yet solved, you see it just by the results given here. Now in order to overcome coupling issues, um, the, the, the best way would be just to go in directly into the inner ear um, with a different type of a cochlear implant. It's called direct acoustic cochlear implant. Direct acoustic means that you go with uh, the coupling not on the auricular chain nor on the round window, but you go directly through the um, foot plate or through the round window into the inner ear. And you see here the transducer is also fixed at the rim. Uh, and you see here it's coupled into the inner ear using a stapes prosthesis. So that is uh, basically the device. It's um, positioned. Um, through the posterior terminotomy, you see here the artificial incus on which the piston is then fixed and goes directly through the foot plate into the inner ear. Uh, it's a two-component system. It, you have an external speech processor like in a, in a cochlear implant. Here you see now um, the situation where the stapes um, prosthesis is inserted. You see here the situation through the posterior terminotomy. Um, and uh, then you can uh, place the stapes prosthesis um, as you would do with any otosclerosis surgery. And then um, you can crimp it, um, and then the, the situation is, so to say, as if you would have done a stapes plasty. And now the movement of the uh, transducer means that it go, the energy is directly um, transmitted into the inner. No coupling issue, as long as in the fluid, um, it should work well. Here, yeah, well, that's what you get. Um, basically, that is the um, unaided uh, AC and that's the uh, unaided BC. And uh, before and after surgery, there is not a major change. Some of the Carhartt effect you would see here, but more or less it's uh, the same procedure as with staples plasty. When we look on the gain, um, you see here that's what the patient have before. These are patients mainly with uh, severe to profound mixed hearing loss. That is where they are before surgery. And that's where, where the gain is, or the threshold, aided threshold, is uh, with the device. So it's much better than with the hearing aid, which is displayed here. To see in the high and low frequencies, this uh, system gives much more um, gain than you would achieve with any hearing aid. And that's also shown then in the, um, in the speech uh, discrimination scores. Um, you see here always the blue bar, which is the score before surgery, and the green bar that is after surgery. Before surgery means with hearing aid, after surgery means with a device. And you see some of these patients basically, they have uh, score zero uh, with the hearing aid, but with the device they jump up to something like 80, 90 uh, percent. Yeah? And that's very convincing um, when you look on, on these results. Also, it's uh, highly significant in terms of the improvement. So um, again, you can see in this diagram, that's pre and that's post. They all should be in this, uh, uh, this part of the diagram showing the improvement. And also, if you go up in presentation level to 80 decibels uh, SPL, it's the same. No? Now, there was always um, a criticism that if you would do staples surgery in those cases where 
the reason for the mixed hearing loss is autosclerosis, and you would give them a hearing aid, then the patients would do the same. Saying so, you see here the results of those patients. And these are patients who had previous dysplasty, um, very good closure of the airbone gap, uh, and hearing aid. And you see the results uh, is on the purple bar. Uh, and now you look what the patients get with the ducts. So you see again, there are some patients uh, with uh, stapesplasty, uh, hearing aid, the score is very low, zero or something like that. And then you give them this device and they jump up. Yeah? So it seems to be that this direct coupling is indeed something which is, is more, um, um, let's say, adequate for um, using the cochlear reserve. Now, the question is, uh, do we have any um, limit of this uh, system? Of course you have. I mean, if your cochlear reserve is too small, then probably you would not um, get um, enough out of it. And that's shown here. Um, that is a comparison between the, the codex and the cochlear implant. Now, how to read this complicated diagram? Well, very simple. Um, you see always the, the, the green um, uh, points are those from the uh, codex patients and the blue ones, the blue triangles are from cochlear implant patients. And of course if, you're, if your hearing would be still too good uh, for a cochlear implant, let's say here something uh, up to 50 decibels, you basically would not give them a, codex, uh, a, a cochlear implant but a codex. And you see the results here from the codex. Now then we come into a transition zone where it's between 55 and 65 or between 65 and 75 of um, uh, average uh, uh, threshold. And you see when you compare, then the results uh, between the cochlear implant and the codex, that especially in noise, the, the green ones are higher up than the blue ones, which means that speech in noise understanding is better uh, with the mechanical stimulator. Now, of course, if you have more uh, hearing loss, let's say 75 and beyond, then um, we, we have not used the codex uh, anymore. Uh, we think that then the cochlear reserve probably is uh, not good enough. Um, and um, again, uh, we also have patients who have with the same uh, type of uh, hearing loss and same threshold, um, um, a codex on one side and the cochlear implant on the other side. And when you look on the results here given um, in uh, two of these um, tests, so two years post-op, uh, with a cochlear implant versus the, the, the codex. So you can see that in, um, in these tests, the one is the monosyllable test, the other is the sentence test in noise, that the, the scores for, those, for the ear where you have the mechanical stimulation is higher than for, uh, compared to the ear that has the electrical stimulation. And again, that shows that as long as you can um, uh, use the uh, acoustic hearing uh, that is uh, true beneficial for the patient, especially in the um, speech in noise um, condition. So let's summarize the indication ranges for these uh, uh, acoustic implants. We see here the working horse indication range uh, for incos and round window coupling. Um, we see here for the cymos, that is the MET, what I showed you. And then we have here the, the DAX, uh, uh, which basically um, has no limit in terms of its amplification, but of course, it has a limit in terms of the cochlear reserve. So I would say once you have a threshold average which is around 80, uh, then probably that's where what you should not um, over, um, overuse. So if you have those patients who then might be not candidates for uh, the mechanical stimulation alone or uh, not at all, then the cochlear implant is the, the uh, treatment of choice. Well, the principle is, as I said, you have an electrode that uh, is close to the nerve uh, the nerve is stimulated uh, electrically, directly, uh, compared to the hair cells which normally produce the current, and then the nerve is activated. Now, the, the difference is that, of course, selectivity of activation is much poorer. You see here already in this example that not only one nerve fiber, but several are activated, which is the main limitation of the current cochlear implant technology, um, bad channel separation, and not enough channels compared to normal uh, hearing. Therefore, um, we try to preserve residual hearing in order to make use of still the acoustic component the patient might have, and we call it hearing preservation cochlear implantation. Now, we see just up to 2012, and perhaps it's even higher today, the percentage of those showing up at our center 
that have still some usable residual hearing. Yeah? So it, seem, it means that we implant more and more patients who have residual hearing, and of course the question comes up, can we preserve this residual hearing in order to give the patient, for instance, with high frequency deafness, the possibility to combine electric and acoustic hearing on the same ear, called hybrid system. Um, the principle is very simple. You replace the uh, high frequency or restore high frequency hearing with electrical stimulation. You, you put an electrode in the cochlea and then um, over a certain uh, frequency um, border, um, the representation of the frequencies electrically. Below that, it's uh, acoustically. The patient can use both uh, for a better hearing, uh, for instance, music listening or speech and noise. So, um, in order to achieve this hearing preservation, you need two things. The one is the electrode, the other is the surgeon and the surgical technique. And um, what we found uh, very um, consistently useful and, and uh, really um, uh, for hearing preservation the best is round window approach. You see here how such a hybrid electrode, as an example, is inserted uh, through the round window. And here again, you can see it for a longer electrode. That's uh, it's a SRA electrode from Cochlea. Just an example. Also, through the round window, you make it very slowly, uh, propagate it to the inser uh, intended insertion depth, and then um, you basically fix the electrode uh, in uh, any manner as you would like to do that. Now, what are the results? What do we get? Are we as good as uh, staple surgeons? Um, well, staple surgeons claim we have no problem. We have never uh, inner, that inner ear. Huh? Okay, let's let's take that. <laughs> I don't believe, but um, okay. So you see, we have uh, dead ears in seven percent. Huh? That's that's where we are at at the moment. Uh, that is the best uh, what uh, what has been published. Um, so if you look on the pre and post operative threshold, you see that in for these individual data points, some patients are here on the ideal diagonal, the same as uh, pre-op. Some of them have a change, let's say, up to 15 decibels, um, others up to 30 decibels, and then you have these outliers, which are basically those who have lost their hearing. Uh, on the median change, you see it here, it's approximately 10 decibels between the pre, uh, pre and the post-operative threshold, which means there is some change, but Still, most of the patients can use the residual hearing um, and um, they have a kind of minor change uh, due to the surgery. Even over time, you see it's, uh, it's quite uh, stable, so this percentage of those with uh, good preservation of hearing is more or less the same. We see uh, an increase in those who lose hearing, probably borderline patients, but also those who have uh, progression of their hearing loss over time underlying disease which might uh, do it has been published uh, and so on. Now, um, if you go for this um, hearing preservation, indeed we want to serve the patient uh, and if the patient would lose hearing, then you probably would not like to have a situation where you have a short electrode, um, which uh, like here the hybrid L only covers the, the basal part of the cochlea, but the patient, if he loses more hearing to the apical one, should then have an electrode which is longer. And therefore, industry has also provided longer electrodes, um, like um, 20 millimeters, uh, 20 uh, millimeters, 28 millimeters, and so on. And uh, of course, you can choose now uh, electrodes from this uh, portfolio. And you would, of course, say, I choose it uh, in relation to the residual hearing I still have. If they have very good residual hearing, I use the shorter one. If it's uh, less um, um, pr um, good, then I would use a longer one. That's what you can do. Okay, now let's look on the data we have got from our center with different um, electrode lengths. Just look on the red numbers. That is the percentage of inner ear damage, of loss, yeah? so to say, dead ears you get after surgery. Again, the, the best is here this uh, 16 millimeter hybrid L, 7%. That is 20 millimeters, that is 20 millimeters, that is 24 millimeters, that is 28 millimeters, and that is a high focus pre curved electrode. So you see, there is some relation between electrode length and the percentage of hearing loss. Now, this gives you a trade off. On one side, you want to have an electrode that's long enough, on the other hand, you might have a higher risk for, for losing hearing. And still, that uh, cannot be resolved. I'll just keep that, okay. 
Now we see here the different electrode lengths and um, also you see the relation to the given anatomy of the patient. The question is why does a patient lose hearing after cochlear implantation? And one reason could be the surgeon, the other could be uh, his cochlea. Uh, and of course the electrode too. No? But uh, what does it mean, the cochlea? Well, we have a pronounced um, uh, variability uh, in the cochlear length. Something that is already known since 1938 by a study made by Hardy, where he basically did measure the cochlear duct length, and it was um, redone by Lee uh, in 2010. And you see that the um, cochlear lengths, uh, cochlear duct lengths raise between 25 and something like 36 millimeters, remarkable for an organ. Um, and of course, if you now want to select the electrode, probably it, it might play a role. So you should uh, be able to measure the cochlear lengths and uh, you should then select an electrode which is basically adapted to that. Um, okay, you can see um, what it means. If you use the same electrode in different cochlear lengths, then you get a so-called uh, different uh, cochlear coverage. Cochlear coverage is just the ratio between uh, the percentage of the cochlear that is covered by the electrode versus the total length. And here it's just given for this uh, example, 24 millimeter. Um, it can vary between something like 0.65 uh, and 0.75, just showing um, that, of course, the cochlear uh, lengths might matter. You see here the lower two uh, graphs, that's the same electrode. Uh, here uh, in, a, in, a, in a longer uh, cochlea and in a shorter cochlea. And you see the tip of the electrode basically goes deeper in or less deep in. Um, and this is, of course, and also reflected in, in the, the resu uh, results of hearing preservation. So if you look for this uh, kind of goal, how can we preserve um, the um, residual hearing cochlear implants and go for individualized cochlear implantation, then electrode length matters um, and other factors also should be considered, like residual hearing, how much does the patient have, is it progressive or is it stable, uh, the cochlear length matters as we said and of course also patient specific factors which are difficult to measure or at least to quantify. Um, and uh, for children of course we also should uh, think about future treatment options, so to be uh, as uh, um, um, little traumatic as possible. Okay, now summarizing these interventions into the inner ear. Um, we have this wonderful portfolio of uh, different devices. Don't worry, if you lose hearing, we can serve you. And you see here the diagram, which basically uh, gives you on one side the amount of sensor and during hearing loss along this diagonal, yeah, going up here. And on the other hand, it gives you here on this um, um, abscissa the amount of airborne gap. Now, uh, it's very simple. If the patient is deaf, you give him a cochlear implant. If he has partial deafness, you do electroacoustic um, um, device, a hybrid device uh, with uh, this kind of hearing preservation surgery. If um, the patient has um, purely conductive loss, then what I didn't mention here is the bone conduction implant, like Baha and, and others. And if you have something in between, uh, like um, a mixed um, um, severe hearing loss, then you can go for middle ear implants, like the Vibrant Soundbridge, like the MET. And if it's more pronounced, then you can go for the ducts. And uh, then you have the full spectrum uh, in play. And it, it's more a matter of make the right decision. Um, for the individual patient and um, then you also could then choose from that. Don't forget middle ear surgery as we have seen it this morning, um, but if that not works then we have this kind of portfolio and in the future there might be some additional things like um, more or better electrodes, I don't want to mention it. Um, we also might be better in preserving the residual hearing by some uh, biological means, we can uh, use some growth factors, whatever, um, and this even will further improve our armamentorium uh, to work with and uh, to fight um, hearing loss and deafness. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> okay. Oh, Neil. This one, uh, this works here. 
Just wanted to ask you if you have experience with or an opinion on uh, the totally implantable device, if there is one still available. Well, you mentioned the totally implantable device. I think it will be the future. Yeah? Um, so people have the wish, uh, invisible hearing, yeah, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> and of course, if you come out with a device that really fulfills it, that's, I think, uh, really much better than what we have today. I think today it's necessary still to have a partial implantable systems because you can easily upgrade uh, the software and all the skin. It's not an issue about the hardware component, which is uh, being outside, can be upgraded. No? And the microphone issue is, is not like that. But the companies are working on that, and uh, we have some. No, we have no, no personally no experience with this team, but we have with the Carina, and also we have uh, a bunch of patients with fully implantable cochlear implants. No? It's experimental; it's not available on the market. It's just for for uh, study purposes. Um, but uh, it's quite clear that this will be the way to go. The batteries have become much better. So the lifetime of the battery uh, in the meantime is up to 10 years or even beyond that. Um, this is an important factor. It means that you have to re-implant after 10 years. Before it was five years. So, and I think it will even go higher up. And the other one is the microphone. The microphone, uh, the implanted one, which picks up all the body noise, which was an issue. You see a patient did hear uh, when I was chewing or water showering and so it's terrible for me. Uh, my own voice sounds not that good and so at all, but this has been much become much better. Well, I think it's a way to go and it will come, no? definitely. Okay, good, so. Nice presentation. Uh, it's a, li a little bit uh, far from the middle here, but not so far. What do you think about hearing restoration after acoustic neuroma surgery? Okay. Um, well, another topic. So, first of all, um, you have two options. No? The one is you can use a cross uh, solution, um, which means any kind of uh, just transmission of uh, sound to the other ear. Uh, second is um, you can go for a cochlear implant. Uh, and uh, this means that the auditory nerve still should function. So um, either you decide it during the removal of the acoustic neuroma or what we do is to do it later on. So it makes promontory stimulation to check the function of the nerve and if it's so then you can give them a cochlear implant, which uh, um, works to, um, to a certain extent. Um, sometimes the nerve is still there but not functioning yeah? and therefore I think it's better to do it post-surgery. Uh, post if they have it on both sides, then of course you also can uh, speak about a brainstem implant if the nerve is damaged on both sides. But for single-sided uh, neural deafness, I would not recommend a, a brainstem implant because the hearing is too poor eh? and it makes, not a, makes no sense to me no, at present. Yeah, the experience with unilateral cochlear implant, okay. Yes? I mean, um, um, there are many patients who have single-sided deafness and uh, the current technology in cochlear implants has improved um, to the level that you can really do it and also recommend it. Um, I think the point is that the patient really um, needs to be aware of the fact that you still will have two different hearings, but you can combine it. And the, the combination is quite good in speech and noise and uh, uh, understanding and in directional hearing. They need some special training sessions where you just use audio books or whatever to train the hearing on the implanted side, even in between, so that they really uh, can focus on it. Um, yes, uh, I think our experience has been six months and one year, uh, because it's, uh, it's unusual for them to now he, um, use poor hearing yeah, compared to the other side. It depends much on the hearing on the, uh, on the other ear. If this hearing is impaired too, yeah, then the acceptance and everything is much higher because they, the ratio, they, yeah, they, uh, they uh, benefit much more uh, from that. Um, well, they, they, well they, need train, they need training, yeah, of course, but uh, I mean, you can do it in a very systematic way. Also, use direct input into the implant uh, so that they can concentrate on that and focus on it. But I mean, the combination of the two uh, devices is simply done in uh, everyday listening conditions. 
It also works in children quite well, no? even better than in adults. No? 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 But while they have the plasticity, I think that's what, what helps them. No? No? Indeed, that's what been, but I haven't shown it in detail, but you can measure the, the length of the cochlea using um, algorithms on the CT scan or the cone beam CT where you can actually get it and then also decide which length because if you have residual hearing uh, and you want to preserve it, depends on how deep the electrode goes. And um, those who have uh, preservation of hearing, probably the, the co cochlear coverage is, is um, smaller than those where you have loose of residual hearing, therefore we do it. No? It's a multiplanar reconstruction, so you just stretch the cochlea uh, virtually and then you can measure along it. No? Yes, yeah, we discuss it for unilateral, yeah, of course. It depends of, uh, on the factors you have. Those who have sudden hearing loss on one side, they basically suffer most, and especially if they have tinnitus. And the suppression of tinnitus is another argument uh, which you get with the, with the cochlear implant. But um, if you have somebody who is deaf from, let's say, childhood on since 40 years, the question is whether it really matters. Depends on what happens on the second year, I would say. Then I would be more uh, careful um, in, in this, uh, in the counseling, um, um, recommending it. Hmm? Okay. Well, you know. Nothing? Reactions and maybe destruction and what is your attitude? Before surgery, to check it before and after, if you have the intention to make a bilateral implantation, especially in children. Yeah. Well, the, the, the rate of vestibular disturbance after cochlear implantation, if it's done in the proper way, with atraumatic technique, as I showed, it's very low, astonishingly. Huh? You would think about much more problems, but that's very, uh, it's very rare. It happens, yeah, of, indeed, and these patients then sometimes really suffer from that, but it's very rare. And therefore, also bilateral implantation is basically done without any of this uh, vestibular disturbance. Just on the opposite, some of these patients who have balance problems with deafness, they do better with uh, the cochlear implant. I think the main reason is that you get this um, orientation in the space, uh, which helps you to, to stabilize the, your, um, bad, your balance. Um. Okay. Well, um, I think uh, the, the statistics says that uh, those who have um, tinnitus or tinnitus uh, before the cochlear implant, you get an improvement in 80% uh, of the patients. You have uh, some patients where it becomes worse, uh, that's a problem, uh, and then you have those where it's not changed. Uh. Now, the main thing you have to get is, um, is um, uh, tinnitus suppression. Uh, uh, residual inhibition also uh, is possible, but it's, it's, ma it's rare. No? So um, um, basically you get the suppression once you use the system and have acoustic input, then the tinnitus is not audible. And um, some of them also have just by the activation itself a kind of um, uh, um, a true suppression. I mean, it's, it's more masking, sorry. It's more the effect of masking. Uh, suppression is the second one, and the residual inhibition is is, uh, uh, is the smallest rate. No? So I would not go for, let's say, those with uh, single-sided deafness. If they come and say, I'm suffering from tinnitus, I only want to have it for tinnitus suppression, I would say, well, that's not, not the right thing. I mean, you, you must have a problem with your hearing. And then the tinnitus, um, uh, the effect on the tinnitus is a secondary benefit you might have. No? Mm -hmm. 